Good morning, everybody. My name is Michelle, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm Michelle. I'm Michelle. I do have experience with this work, as it's laid out in the big book, with the help of a big book step study sponsor, an amazing book. Um, I've made all the amends that I can for now, and I practice these steps on a daily basis. Um, I'm honored to be here today. 20, 20 years is a big deal. Uh, it's so exciting. Uh, in the month of May, I also celebrated my anniversary um, of eight years of continuous sobriety. And um, so it's, a, it's always nice when I have the opportunity to share around my anniversary, and I never have to plan that. God always takes care of that for me. No matter what, I always have to share. I'm always uh, speaking uh, around this time, and, and uh, it's you know, perfect the way it's laid out. So um, you know, I'll run through a little bit about my experience, my strength, and my hope. Um, you know, I, I, my background uh, is, um, you know, probably similar to all of you. I grew up in an alcoholic home. Uh, alcohol was normal to me. Large consumptions of alcohol, partying, um, kids playing wildly at cookouts, uh, fights erupting, uh, mom and dad fighting uh, and threatening divorce. Um, those were those are some of the things that went on in my life um, as a child. Um, I'm the first of three, and um, I was the one that they practiced on. <laughs> and so um, it was it was in my teenage years that um, I was really, really discontent. I don't think that there's a picture past the age of eleven, between the ages of eleven and twenty where where I ever was smiling. And my mother used to say to me, you just wait, you're going to regret that. You're going to regret that you never looked at the camera and smiled. And she's like, you never, never smiled. I was, I was really unhappy as a teenager. Um, everybody was stupid. Everything. <laughs> um, I didn't understand why, uh, you know, why I felt this way, but I didn't feel comfortable. Um, at about 16, my dad, um, my dad was having trouble with alcohol. And um, my parents sat me down and said, so dad's an alcoholic and uh, he's gonna get sober and you need to understand what this means for you as the child of an alcoholic. Um, and that's where he gave me, they gave me that ominous warning which I failed to heed um, that Bill talks about in the, you know, in the big book, um, in his story. They, you know, they, they taught me, they sat me down and they talked to me about alcoholism. They told me what the disease looked like. They told me that just because dad, you know, binge drank, drank on the weekends and just because he lost his license and only once and just because he wasn't underneath the bridge and mom and dad were staying married that he was still an alcoholic. Um, and then they proceeded to tell me about, you know, my family and the family tree and how marinated in alcohol we were. Uh, alcohol and drugs, and it was everywhere, in every, in every aunt and uncle, every cousin, um, you know, and behind that is mental illness and suicide. And, um, and we, you know, they unraveled the family secrets, and there were no secrets in our family. Um, and that was really weird for the first, I don't know, five to ten years of my parents' sobriety, my, my father's sobriety, because there was no secrets, which meant there was no boundaries on any information that was shared ever. <laughs> um, so that was my young adulthood. So every mistake I ever made, it was everybody knew about it. And, uh, um, but, you know, so here I am at 16, restless, cerebral, and discontent. Um, you know, I know what it looks like. I've had it demonstrated for me what resentment looks like because my parents are really resentful at each other and at the world. And um, I know what to do when you get resentful. You talk about each other. You put each other down. You, um, you blame others. And I, I learned. Um, I learned that, you know, that men were stupid and, and irresponsible and... Um, I, you know, I, I just learned a bunch of things growing up in this household of turmoil that um, bringing it into the world, I really wasn't prepared. Um, and so when I started to have my own challenges as, as a young adult, um, I was not going to touch alcohol because I didn't want that to be my story. And so I stayed away from alcohol for a bit and I found other activities that took me away from myself. Um, and, you know, for me, my drug of choice was, was pot and um, and I, you know, at a really, at probably at 19, I remember my college roommate saying to me, I think that you're trying to escape your feelings. And I was like, of course, aren't you? 
Um, aren't you? Like, what? Is there any other way? Why, why else would we do this? <laughs> um, and I remember the ease and the comfort, you know, of, of alcohol and drugs taking away that, um, that knot in my stomach and that, discont that, that desperation that it's always going to be this bad. I'm always going to feel this bad and I need it to go away now. You know, and that's like teenage feelings, really. That's, that's like what happens with teenagers. I didn't know that, like, if I just hold on, that'll pass. And I took that behavior into my adulthood. I didn't know that feelings pass, that you, things go move through and I don't need to escape and run. So I learned to escape and hide my feelings and stuff my feelings and blame others and lash out. And um, I proceeded to, you know, I, I proceeded to go, um, you know, through my young adulthood, you know, blaming others for the way that I felt on the inside um, and hiding my feelings. I had young, I had children. <coughs> I rushed into, you know, I, I married a guy to take me away from, you know, responsibility in life and um, had children, you know, starting at the age of 20. And, um, and I was a really good mom. I was a young mom, but I was a good mom and I was in it. And I wasn't drinking and I wasn't drugging. And I, you know, I did what I was supposed to be doing. I paid attention to my children and I was, I was nurturing and I was a stay at home mom. Um, and, um, I was taught by my mother at a young age that I, you know, because they were going through their own recovery and their own version of recovery, that I am not, um, that I'm responsible for my own feelings and that everybody else is not to blame for the way that I feel. She used to, I used to say, you make me feel, and she'd say, I don't, you don't, I don't make you feel anything. Those are for you. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? You know? And, um. But I didn't understand that. I didn't really understand that concept. I was too young, and so I projected that onto my, my first husband. I was like, you make me feel. You make me feel you're not good enough. You're not doing enough. Um, you know, I was out to you know, prove it to the world that I mattered and I was important and that I deserved better. Even though I don't have to work for it. <laughs> I don't need to support myself. I don't need to support my children. He needs to. Um, and, I, and, I, and this discontentedness built um, and, you know, and I spent a lot of time, and I know now, through having done the work, that I shamed my, my first husband constantly because he wasn't living up to my expectations because I needed the outside world to make me okay. I struggled so deeply in that area. Um, you know, you need to make me happy in everything that I was doing. Um, and that's probably my biggest, most sincerest amends that I made to him was like, you were not responsible for my happiness, and I constantly put you in charge of that. Um, and that was, you know, obviously, you know, I picked a guy who could tolerate that, um, which is sad in its own right, because any human being doesn't need to be treated as less than, and I treated him as less than, because I didn't know how to deal with my pain. Um, so you put all that discontentedness in, and, um, it makes me want to go file for divorce. And so if I'm going to file for divorce, I have to go get a job and be responsible and take care of my children. And so, uh, you know, my oldest is six at the time, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to get a job, and I'm leaving them. <laughs> and I'm figuring it out, because I deserve better. <laughs> maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But that was my plan. And um, as soon as I got to the work world, um, you know, I had, I had some some skills, some intuition that worked out well, and I succeeded um, from the, from the get-go, but I had, um, but at the same time, I met this guy that gave me the strength and the courage uh, to, you know, to walk away from my marriage and jump in full force into blowing up my family's life. Because he drank the way that I wanted to drink, he partied the way that I wanted to party, he made me feel the way that I wanted to feel. And, um, and, that was, uh, and that was what I proceeded to do. And, um, you know, I, I just, I literally pulled the house right down on us. We foreclosed on our house um, and, you know, unraveled a marriage. And, and I jumped right into that next relationship. Um, filled the fridge with alcohol. I remember vividly seeing the whole, a whole shelf full of alcohol and going, that's ah, not good. That's what dad used to do. I just got, I found a guy who fills the whole shelf with alcohol. Uh-oh. 
Because my first husband wasn't an alcoholic. He didn't drink the way that I wanted to drink. He didn't use that as an outlet. That wasn't his thing. He had other issues, but that wasn't it. And so when I had found this guy, he felt like home. His family felt like home. I don't know anything else. I know what this is, this normal life, this alcoholic life is normal to me. And so when the fridge is filled, I can recognize that warning that mom and dad gave me. But I'm still drinking, right along with them. I'm still escaping. Um, and so, you know, everybody in the family is shaking their head, going, what the heck is she doing? You know, and I'm a young adult, young, young 20s, and what is she doing? These poor kids, whatever, you know, making a mess. And, everybody, and I'm like, don't worry, I'm, I got this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it all off. I'm going to figure it all out. And, um, and I, you know, the truth about that is that we, you know, proceeded to make more mess. We, we, um, it looked okay on the outside, right? I pulled it off. We got a new house, a big, beautiful, brand new house. The new front porch and a great lawn and everything looked like it was okay. And what was going on inside the house was complete chaos. I started labeling shit. Excuse my language, I'm sorry if there's kids in the room. I started labeling things because I was trying to control my life. <laughs> like, it was so out of control. I had every, every cabinet labeled with what should be there. And of course, no one complied with putting the, <laughs> anything where it was supposed to be. I mean, I controlled the way that my kids ran down the, the hall. I controlled how loud they were when they went up the stairs. I controlled everything. Um, and I drank to deal with the, um, the, the chaos that was going on inside me. Um, it was really, you know, and we'd sit out on our front porch and, and, you know, it was taking, you know, Bill talks about like drink was taking up an exhilarating part in our lives. It was. Like, mom, my mother-in-law moved in and took care of the kids every Thursday night so we'd go out drinking. And, uh, and she helped us keep it all together so that we could go do, we could sit on the front porch, we'd put the kids to bed as early as possible, sit out there and smoke cigarettes and drink our wine and beer and and you know, dance till 2 a.m. on the front porch. And we thought, this is, this is good. <laughs> um, but obviously, you know, what's happening inside is that we're, you know, it, I'm unraveling. I'm, I'm completely unraveling. And I can't, you know, things are feeling more and more out of control. And, um, uh, and you know, I'm trying to hide more and more. It's, you know, we start, we were, you know, partying, I was partying at work, I was partying with the neighbors, I was partying six days a week. And I, you know, my idea of a, an alcoholic is somebody who drinks seven days a week. So I still had, I still had that, that idea in my mind that if I just control my alcohol, my intake, then I will be all right. Um, and I always, I always drank without my, you know, without my permission. I mean, that's, it, it just, it was no longer... Um, it was no longer, you know, a luxury thing or a thing that we did on the weekends. It was, a, you know, it was required because I couldn't function. Because if I didn't drink, then my kids were too annoying. They were too frustrating. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to parent. So I needed to have the alcohol, um, you know, to be okay. And, um, and then it was over. Because he drank too much one day and it needed to be over. And so, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit too because that's what you do. And so he goes off into Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm, I'm, I'm cold turkey. And I go, I walk into the doors of Al-Anon and I'm like, he's got such a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and now I got such a problem and I need help with the problem. Because I did understand that, hey, I, was, I came from an alcoholic family. So I got some stuff. Um, and I know that I, you know, I picked him. I know that I like was drawn to it, so I got to fix what's broken inside of me. And so I, were, I, I spent some time in Al-Anon, about eight, uh, you know, 16, 18 months or so in Al-Anon, and I got, I got better. I controlled less. I let go. I learned how to um, allow a higher power into my life. I realized that I was no longer responsible for everything and everybody in the world. That was a huge relief um, because I was so trying to control it. I was so sick. Um, and so unhappy and so that I started to feel a little bit better but you know the problem was that I had this like uh, it's his problem not mine when it comes to alcohol and um, I had no defense against the first drink someone would hand me alcohol and I could not say no and I surrounded myself my first sponsor was like you pick the people you pick so that you could do what you wanted to do and I was like what 
What do you mean? And I did. I, I mean, I had a boss that was a heavy drinker, and so, like, he needed me to drink with him so that he could feel okay with drinking. So he had, he, you know, he was double-fisted all the time, taking care and feeding alcohol to me, and I, I would, but I got to take it. You know, I was never responsible for myself. I, you know, my husband stopped to get the wine on the way home. I didn't. That wasn't my idea. My husband bought the cigarettes. They're not my cigarettes. I mean, I smoked a pack a day, and he bought them, so it didn't matter. Didn't, I mean, I was so, so unwilling to accept responsibility in my life for myself ever. Um, and so I had no defense against the first drink when, when someone would hand it to me. So during that 16 months when he's in AA and he's trying to, he, he, you know, he's trying to hold on and stay sober. I'm running off at work events and getting trashed and can't really control it. And I'm drinking completely without my permission. I'm drinking when I plan not to. I'm drinking that no matter what the stakes are, I'm drinking anyways. And so here I am thinking I have control sometimes, but then sometimes I don't. And it's all bets are off. And I think I'm going to drink one and I drink ten. And that's where I had that hopelessness, that, that, that experience of... Um, um, I, I'm, at the time, I'm reading the big book now, and I'm being exposed to the big book and uh, Joe and Shelley through, um, through Al-Anon, and I'm working with other Al-Anons, and I'm talking about this state of mind um, that precedes the first drink, and I'm translating. So I'm like, you don't understand this? What do you mean you don't understand this? Let me show you. Like, this is what happens. You know, you're really angry and you're really frustrated and you can't deal with life, and so you drink. You don't, you don't do that. <laughs> you know, and um, you don't ever drink more than you planned. And so it's starting to come together for me, but I'm not really willing, right? So there's a part in the book, right? It's like a, um, it says, some of you are thinking, yes, what you tell us is true, but it doesn't fully apply. We admit we have some of these symptoms, but we've not gone to the extremes you fellows have. <laughs> Nor are we likely to, for we understand ourselves so well what you have told us as that such things cannot happen again. We have not lost everything in life through drinking. And, that, and we certainly do not intend to. Thanks for the information. <laughs> and that was me. That was me. Uh, I, I could not um, get there. And... Um, you know, it's that the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink, uh, except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. I just couldn't get there. Until I did. Until I drank too much, I did, did stupid things, and, and I woke up the next morning and said, I could never be an alcoholic because this hangover is too bad. And I heard the words, and I was like, tag, I'm it. <laughs> and so I walked through, the, uh, walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, um, and, you know, there was someone there greet, you know, greeting me right away saying, you know, what are you doing? Here's your phone. Here's my phone number. Um, you don't like this meeting, go to another meeting. You think this meeting is nuts, go to another one. Um, I'll take you to this one. I'll meet you here. And this woman, um, you know, two weeks in was like, do you have a sponsor? No, I don't have a sponsor. What are you doing? I'm shopping. Okay? Just leave me alone. I'm shopping. I'm looking for the right person. <laughs> Fine. Yes. Will you be my sponsor? I'd be honored. <laughs> <laughs> and so she made me call her. Like every day. I hated it. Every day I had to call her at 7 o'clock in the morning and I had to tell her what was on my mind. And I was like, you know what? There's nothing on my mind in the morning. Can we talk at night? Because at night I'm enough. <laughs> She's like, that's why we talk in the morning. Because <laughs> I wanted a therapist. She wanted me to get well. <laughs> Um, and so she'd be like, what was your prayer meditation look like? You know, what did, what did you, did you do any readings today? You know, and every morning I'd get up and I'd write a prayer. I had a 24 hours a day book that had space at the bottom for, to, for my own writing and journaling. And I wrote a prayer every day and I didn't, that wasn't like an instruction. That was just something that kind of evolved and happened. But I look back today and I go, that is so beautiful. That was so God guided. And I didn't even know what I was doing. <laughs> It was just, and so it's like, I, you know, God was doing for me what I couldn't have done for myself. I don't even know how that happened, but it was, it was a beautiful way to build a relationship with God. And, and um, you know, I, what I didn't know is that she was, uh, she was starting, um, she was starting the reading and the 
writing through the big book step study process. She had 25 years or so of sobriety and um, I was just following her. I didn't know what I was doing. But, uh, you know, she seemed like she had it together and, um, and she seemed like a leader in the group, right? Because you don't, when you first come to AA, you don't understand how it all works. And so she seemed to have an okay life. And so I just followed her. I, I did what she said. And so when she said that, you know, we were going to read at 6 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, I said, okay, I'll be there. And I was like, is this lady serious? <laughs> this is early. Um, but, you know, am I willing to go to any lengths? Am I willing to show up when my sponsor's available? Or am I going to, like, get bent out of shape because they're not going to meet me on my terms? Because i got a busy life. i got a lot of kids. I get, th I get three kids, and I work full time. And doesn't she know that I have other things? And all she has is her and her husband. Like, why, why 6 a.m.? <laughs> what I didn't understand is that she was sponsoring more than one person. <laughs> Probably six. And, uh, you know, but I showed up anyways. I did it. And uh, I was ready and eager. I was a good sponsee. I was, I like, I, I followed directions most of the time. Um, I said, you know, we met on a regular basis and we, and we read and, and, um, you know, I had, I had underlined certain things and we talked through what I underlined and highlighted. Um, we'd look up words. I had looked up words ahead of time. I was given instruction similar to what I'm sure some of you have been given where you, you know, look up the words ahead of time. I liked that because I was kind of, in, I, I'm a learner, so I was willing to look up words. I have like this fascination with words. So I always found that really fun and interesting and she expected to, you know, me to, you know, uh, reject that. But I, no, I'm in, I, I like words. So I found it really interesting. Plus half of the book was written in a, in a way that was not as current <laughs> as what I was used to. So I needed, to honestly, in order to understand it truly, I needed that process. Um, I, you know, when I, when I met with her, um, she had suggested probably, you know, when I, was, when I got into the writing, she had she suggested that I get a fourth step buddy, probably because I was driving her crazy. Um, with, you know, all the stuff that's coming up in my mind and the ideas and like what, you know, I, during my writing I was probably a little nuts and life was really busy and crazy and, and um, so I, had, I got a four-step buddy that was also, that she was sponsoring as well and I can tell you that, thank God I did that. We spent hours talking about the process and about, about spirituality, about God, trying to come to an understanding um, I just found somebody who was equally as interested in figuring out and equally as concerned about how this seems kind of ridiculous. Like, do I really have to write the same thing that I do over and over again? Um, yes, is the answer I needed to know. I needed to know these are the things that I employ without a God. Um, but I, I'm grateful that I had that time with that person. Um, it wasn't always healthy conversation. It wasn't. <laughs> Um, cause you know, water finds its own level and, um, you know, we said things that we would never say to our sponsor, to each other, you know, we'd gossip when we shouldn't be gossiping. We do all the things that you're not supposed to do with the filled with character defects so that, you know, but I'm grateful for that time and I'm grateful for that person cause I understand the work. I understood what I was doing. I grew during that time. I got to the fifth step and, uh, I had 18 months of writing and by the time I was done with, um, the eight, you know, the 18 months and I started to read, I was reading my earlier writing and I had seen the growth. I could see how much I understood the work. I could see what God was doing in my life. I could see that I could now understand and see myself coming a little bit better in the resentments that I had written down that had gripped me for years. I mean, back into childhood were just not there by the time I was reading it. I was already relieved of some stuff that I thought I would never be relieved of. So now that's not everybody's experience. I've sponsored enough women that have not had that experience. So if you don't have that experience, that's okay. That was my experience is that I started to see God. Um, I started to see that I had spent so much time with self-help books over the years <laughs> trying to fix my problem. Um, and the problem was that I could never ever see myself in it. Every time I read those books, including Alcoholics Anonymous, I saw my husband, my sister, my mother, my father. I, I saw everybody else and things that they could do that would fix their lives. And I could never see how the, that stuff pertained to me. 
Well, when I did the writing, it started to help me see how everything pertained to me and how I had set the ball in motion. Even in the, even the most ridiculous things that I felt I was completely a victim to, I had set the ball in motion with my expectations of others. I would go back repeatedly to the same person who has proven over and over again that they can't give me what I need and I'm gonna make you give me what I need and I'm gonna be pissed when you don't. How dare you? Over and over and unreasonable expectations. Unreasonable expectations. Failing to see that this person could not, was not capable of giving and I surrounded myself with not capable. My standards were not high enough. I didn't have, I, I didn't have a good picker. <laughs> Sorry, honey, I love you. <laughs> um, when I proceeded into the, um, the, the work of the fifth step, I had, there was times when she would, you know, she'd be almost asleep. I just, I mean, my stuff wasn't that interesting. <laughs> she, you know, and I, and I kept thinking like, is she seriously gonna fall asleep during this? Like, <laughs> And now there's times I've done fist steps and it gets long. I mean, there's been times where I'm like, no, no, you can't, fall, you can't fall asleep. This is important to them. You know, and it, it's not that it's not important to me. I love a beautiful opportunity to, to hear someone's fist step, but sometimes it's, you know, it's long and monotonous because it's, we do the same thing. It's not, it's not unique. You know, I, I'm thinking that I'm reading, I'm like turning the page going, oh, I can't read that. She's got, she's, what's she gonna say? I turn the page and I read it and she goes, oh, I did that too. Oh, we're ridiculous, aren't we? I'm like, what? <laughs> this is not funny. <laughs> but it is, really, when, and it's beautiful that I could laugh at it. You know, it's beautiful that I could laugh. Um, and so today, you know, when I'm listening to a fist step, I, I try to hide the giggle because I know what it's like to be on the other side of the giggle and you're like, I'm not laughing at you. I'm just laughing at us <laughs> and our, our human condition as alcoholics. Um, so we proceeded to go on to the work, um, you know, on through the work, six and seven. I didn't understand six and seven at the time. I had to go make a little bit more of a mess in my life before I really understood six and seven. But I did it as I was instructed. My seven step instructions were to write down, you know, what I was, my character defects on one side and then what I was, um, you know, working towards and trying to live in my life. And, um, you know, I'd get up and say the, say the seven step prayer every morning and, you know, and I'd, and I'd add some character defects in that I'd be working on in my morning prayer. You know, please help me with gossip, selfishness, um, dishonesty. And, you know, I was trying to fix me. Like, so needless to say, character defects don't go anywhere. <laughs> And after I'm through that work, you know, that part of the work, I'm still doing everything I just read to my sponsor and feel like I never want to do again. Like, I'm still, I still don't know how to live. And I proceed into eight and nine, and I get to, I get to the eight and nine part, and, um, and this is the part where I didn't get a lot of guidance, because remember, my sponsor was just a little bit ahead of me, but not really enough ahead of me in this part of the work that I really, really needed to get guidance elsewhere. This is, I went to a men's meetings. Our group started an amends meeting, and we went. I went there, and I and I read. I wrote my amends letters out. I read them to the group. I got feedback. I worked with my sponsor. She gave me feedback. I worked with people when I had a particular type of amends that my sponsor didn't have experience with. I went to somebody who had experience with that. Um, I intuitively knew that when I was hearing from my sponsor was not necessarily on track with what felt right. This is where I'm starting to have a God consciousness and an intuition that I can trust. Because mm -hmm. for the longest time, I could not trust my own thinking. But now I'm starting to come to a place where I just know that that's not how I should go to this person. This is not something I should say because I'm going to cause harm. Um, I need a way to say it that won't cause harm. It doesn't mean I need a way to not do it. I need to still go to this person, but I need a way to say it that's not going to cause harm. And so in order to do that, I needed to be working with people who had experience crafting their words. And I, um, at this point, I was frequently reaching out to one particular woman who had a lot of experience with the men's, and I was talking to my sponsor less. I had, and I share this because I think it's important, it's part of my story, and it's a lot of people's stories. 
I see people go through this too because it's a stage of your growth and development. Um, I had 10 step buddies. My sponsor, um, I heard around in meetings to get 10 step buddies. And you know what that means to me is it's somebody that you go and write out your, your um, resentment that you run into during the day or your fear. You use the turnaround that you used in the writing and fourth step. And then you call somebody and you read it to them. And they ask you, they, you know, maybe share some feedback with you, but, you know, then for the most part, the call's over. Or they read their tense back to you. And that's a 10-step buddy. And I started having a bunch of 10-step buddies. And what that meant is that I had to get vulnerable with someone besides my sponsor. That meant I had to have a relationship with other women that were strong, that had different experience with their writing. They had a different sponsor. They had different feedback to provide. And I started to glow, grow and learn in a different way. It also meant that I was pulling further and further away from my sponsor and closer and closer to one particular woman who understood that, you know, the amends in the back half of the steps. Um, that uh, in between there was another sponsor that for a quick time I did a, a quick tune-up on my writing. I, she read it. I mean, I read it to her. She gave me some clarity around my mother in particular. But she got really sick pretty quickly into our relationship, and I started using me as her sponsor instead of me using her as a sponsor. Mm -hmm. So I had to work through that, and I had to leave that person. And meanwhile, there's this one person who's always there that I've been talking to, and, I, and she says, well, do you want me to just temporarily sponsor you? And I'm like, but you're one of my great friends. I don't know if I want to do that. And she's like, well, but I'm doing it anyways. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll do it temporarily. And it's like, I don't know, six years later, <laughs> she's done my sponsor. Um, and uh, so getting new sponsors, don't be afraid to grow. Don't be afraid to go if it's time. Um, seek out people. Um, I, you know, I needed to learn how to stay in the work, and I needed women that were staying in the work in order to do that. I had, um, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm in you know, doing my step tens, like at first, I'm like, this is so annoying. Every single day I have resentments. Every single day I am afraid. Is this how I have to live for the rest of my life? Like, can I really do this work? Can I really be that diligent? And um, the answer is that if I want to be happy, joyous, and free, I am going to be that diligent. I, I am going to allow God to discipline me in a simple way. And it's not always like that. I can tell you that today it's not always like that. I don't have some days, some weeks, I'm, you know, some weeks my step 11 and inventory at the end of the night is yes, 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 yes. And here's how. <laughs> yes, I was resentful. Yes, I was afraid. Yes, I, um, you know, I was so selfish. Yes, I owe amends. And here's who it needs to be to. So yeah, there's times that that's the case. But generally speaking, what I didn't know at that time is, no, it's not going to be like this forever because what's happening at the, during this work is that I'm growing, that those character defects that I've asked God to remove, because I'm, I'm being disciplined in this area, things are being removed. God is working with me. I'm not working against God saying I'm just going to do nothing and hope that this gets better or this is good enough because I'm looking not to have, um, you know, a, an okay life. I'm looking to have like a happy, joyous, and free life that is like second to none, that's beyond anything that I could ever subscribe to myself. That's what I'm looking for. I want to I, I want to feel just as awesome or even more awesome, um, you know, drug free and alcohol free. Um, I, I mean, I need to have that 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 spiritual high. Because once I started to feel this spiritual awakening that's occurring in my life, I want more. And the way that I get to more is more time with God, more time meditating, more time doing my inventory, more time connecting with women. And oh, by the way, I need to start working with women. I started working with women in the middle of my fourth step, um, which was good. It kept me writing. Uh, they probably got some weird advice. Uh, but not all bad. But, you know, I, there were some women that I rode along with. Um, and I'm grateful for that because they kept me going. I had, because I'm competitive, I'm in sales. I had, to be, I had to be better than them and faster than them and I had to have my stuff together. So when they asked me a question, I needed to research the answer. <laughs> so that was good for me. And, uh, you know, and so I, I brought women through the work right from the get-go. Um, I, I, um, I didn't really attract many people. 
you know, until later. Um, but when it, came, when it comes to sharing this message and um, in, in finding our purpose, I, today, this is, you know, sponsorship is the single most important thing in my life that keeps me um, grounded in this program. It keeps me showing up. Um, I can't not go to a meeting if, like, I have, like, five or six people that are like, hey, I need you to look at my writing. Hey, I need to, I need to read some tens to you. Like, they tell me ahead of time, I, if I want to not show up, I'm a jerk. I care what other people think still, <laughs> you know? So, so that keeps me going. And, um, you know, surrounding myself in this fellowship and this, this beautiful part, that, this fellowship that's grown up um, around me has just been amazing. It's like um, listening to fifth steps, you know, as a, as a sponsor, I have the opportunity to really understand in, uh, my, my purpose. And so I'll share with you one quick experience um, with, with listening to a fifth step. I have, um, I have a, my oldest child gave me a run for my money. And, um, I mean, oppositional defiance disorder, if anybody knows anything about it, it's rough. It is rough. And I had, um, and I was his target. And I was the one who couldn't not take the bait. <laughs> and, uh, and he would, you know, he was constantly baiting me. And um, so it was very tumultuous. And that was right after I finished the work. So I had constant resentment and hatred, really, towards this child. And that's hard. It's heartbreaking as a mother to feel that way about your child. And, um, and you know, love them so much, but just really, really not enjoy their presence. And I'm in the middle of a fist step. And I have this, you know, I don't know, 65-year-old woman that I'm listening to. And she's sharing her childhood, her resentments towards her mother. And she's describing what she was like as a child and, she, and her turnarounds. And I'm realizing that, like, I got oppositional defiance disorder on a 65-year-old woman who's sharing what it's like to be a child that can't, that does this behavior and is totally broken and doesn't know why mom is like locking her outside of the house because mom doesn't know what to do. And here I am saying, I've done that. I've locked my son outside of the door of the house because I don't know what to do because he's coming at me constantly. Can I tell you what that feels like as a mom? And to the healing that occurred between the two of us on two different ends of the spectrum, you know, the deep sadness that I have for my child, no longer hatred, filled with compassion because at that point we were estranged him and I were estranged because it was like I throw my hands at 19 you gotta go I can't do it anymore we're estranged and the healing and the love moves in because I now see this child through my sponsee fully not that I didn't I didn't want anything that I felt for my child but I, it, it healed me in a way that nothing else could have healed me and it healed her in a way for her mom that nothing else could have healed her and we're sitting on the, a rock in the middle of overlooking a river and like the light is shining on us and it's in its divine purpose. I know what God's doing here in my life every single time and I just need to show up for it. So when a sponsee says, will you work with me? I say, yes, yes, I can't wait for what I'm gonna learn. When a sponsee tells me that they're going through some stuff and now they're, gonna, they're going from a girl to a guy and I'm gonna have to learn how to work through that, I say, yes. Yes, I'm going to work through that with you because I can't wait to see what God's going to teach me about my gender biases. Holy shit. I can't believe how much I've have, I have held biases against men that I didn't even know I held because I can't say to a sponsee like, oh, men, right? When I'm just, just all my women sponsees, I could. I could get away with that. I can't do that anymore. I show up for what God has for me today, this divine purpose, my life is amazing as a result of being willing to show up and say yes when I want to say no. Back to what my sponsor, first sponsor taught me. I do the opposite of everything I want to do. I am selfish and self-centered. I don't want to give my time. But I know that when I give my time, God shows up. I have, I have worked through um, going from a place where we struggled financially to get by we were in such financial distress i didn't i remember the day that he got sober i thought there's we are we're gonna we're gonna lose our house we have six months before we're we're out in the streets 
I, we don't have the kind of cash that it's going to take to be able to build this back. I'm going to destroy another marriage and destroy my children again. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know how this is going to be okay. And now we're still together. We have this beautiful marriage with beautiful relationships with our children. They're all back. Then there's been estrangement and challenges, and they're all back. You know, we have a new grandchild. Um, we have financial security that I never, ever dreamed of. Again, beyond anything that I could ever have expected. And we have that financial security because we've been given skills. I'm like an adult now. Like, I know how not to react emotionally. And guess what? At work, they paid me for that. <laughs> you know? Like, I know how not to be an emotional firecracker. <laughs> I, have a, I lead a team of people and I teach them the turnaround process. What's the story you're telling yourself about that frontline employee that called out sick again? What's the story you're telling yourself? <laughs> that this is about you? That they're trying, to get, they're trying to attack you? They're not trying to attack you. They're thinking about themselves. They got their own lives. It has nothing to do with you. What are you afraid of? They're like, what do you mean what are you afraid of? I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> like, okay. What do you not want to happen, <laughs> right? So I find ways to use this work in all of my affairs. These principles are in all of my affairs, in every part of my life. Um, I, you know, I just continue to be given opportunities. And I'm in the middle of a job change. Um, and I've had the opportunity to receive a promotion. And so yesterday I was saying goodbye to my team. And the things that people said to me, the amount of impact that I have ha been able to have on others, is all so God-given. I was so broken 10 years ago when I first walked into a 12-step meeting. I was not able to provide anybody in, with any kind of guidance. I could not keep my, my emotions in check. Everybody else was responsible. I was a victim. And today, my, or yesterday, my employee says to me, you taught me that my employees are not a reflection of me. I am only responsible for how I respond when they behave badly. I am not responsible for how, for, for how they show up. And I was like, that's al -Anon, baby. <laughs> it's all God, all God. And I have a place that I can, I can, um, I, I get that feedback. I get that reinforcement that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'll sit with a sponsee and they'll share with me. They'll be in the middle of my antics as a 25 year old and I'll be like it's gonna be okay if it's okay with me it can be okay with you that third step prayer with victory over him if I may bear witness to those I may help with thy power thy love and thy way of life that's the purpose that's why we're doing this so that we can show that God has that God can work and if God can make this beautiful life that he's given me given my husband given my kids given my grandchildren, my future grandchildren, um, then he can do it for all of you. And I think that all starts is it, with being willing to do this work and show up. And uh, I'm really, really grateful to be here in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and congratulations on your 20 years and 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs>